Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon by Pastor Greg Judd is in Luke 12. The title is Bigger Barns. There, Christmas is a time. It's a time for giving, right? Yeah, that's what we like to say, but Christmas is a time for getting also, if you're truly honest about it. Um, we like at least a little bit to get something right. It doesn't have to be the big thing, but you don't like to be forgotten. No one does. We all like to get gifts. <clears throat> and uh, so with, with that in mind, we're going to look at a story uh, from, from the Scriptures in Luke chapter 12. If you want to take your Bible and go ahead and turn there, we'll get most of our passage, most of our Scriptures from there this morning, Luke chapter 12. <clears throat> but before we go there, I want to take you on a journey back in, in my life Back in 1962-ish, okay, before some of you were born, I know that, um, the Ideal Toy Company came out with this great toy, and it was called Bop the Beetle, Bop the Beetle. So there's a, there's a picture of the, the game Bop the Beetle, and when I was two or three or four, whatever the number adds up to be, my mom tells me that I had to have this game, Bop the Beetle. Anybody ever hear Bop the Beetle before? And nobody did in early service. Hey, we got one? All right, so I, don't, I couldn't find the commercial on YouTube. Uh, the ideal co- toy company is out of business. But I did find this picture, and it's a, it's, there's the frog. And, and here's how the game works. The frog, you open his mouth, and it has some kind of spring-loaded thing there. But there's his mouth open, and it's your job to bop the beetles. There they are, in, into the mouth, and then it'll hit this mechanism. The frog's mouth closes, and you win, or you get a point. Okay? Bop the beetle. Now, <clears throat> I, can, I, I can imagine uh, Joe, who sings up here. Joe's very competitive. I can imagine me and Joe. As a matter of fact, as I was thinking about this game, it would just be great to find an old version of Bop the Beetle, clear all these out, and just me and him play right here. And here's, but here's how it works. Here's how it works. They give you these two little plastic baseball bats, and you bop the, you bop the football-looking beetle on a trajectory to try to get it in the mouth. So you can imagine a two, three, four, my brother's a year older than I am, us, with our great skill level, how often it went into the mouth of the frog, right? Not very often, but it was exciting. We saw it on TV, and my mom said for weeks, I would just say, Bop the Beetle, Bop the Beetle. They couldn't find the game, and so they went out last minute looking for it, and they said they way overpaid for it, which was probably about $6 back then. I don't know. But, uh, and she also said that we bopped more than the Beetle, which you can imagine giving sticks like that to four- and five-year-olds or whatever. But that, that's a Christmas memory, and it was exciting. It was exciting for me to get that. And uh, quite honestly, you know, I still, it's nice when you get something good, right? When you get something good. Well, we're going to talk of a story in the New Testament. It talks about getting and it talks about giving. <clears throat> and the title of my message this morning is called Bigger Barns. Bigger Barns. So what I'm going to do is that we're in Luke chapter 12. And before we read from there, I'm going to give you a synopsis of the story. So typically what, what I would do is I would read the whole passage and then we'd go back and we'd break it down verse by verse. But it's a very long passage. So I'm going to give you the highlights of the story so you'll get an idea of where we're going, okay? So Jesus tells a story about a rich guy who wanted to build bigger barns because he had so much stuff. And then he died. Okay, so that's the story. Okay, so now you know where we're going. Okay? So I hate to just start in the middle and then you're thinking, where's this going? So now, spoiler alert, you know what happens. But Jesus tells this story, and, and along the journey of telling the story, there's a lot of good things that we can take to heart, especially this Christmas season. So Jesus is <clears throat> he's speaking to the crowds. He's doing his Jesus thing. He's, he's teaching the multitudes. They're, they're all around him. And he finishes in the Scripture just before this passage. He for, finishes teaching on a subject, and apparently there's a, a lull or a lapse of time. I'm not really sure. But in, at this point, we pick it up in Luke chapter 12, verse 13, and here's the story. <clears throat> Someone in the crowd said to him, said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between 
you. So here's a guy, been following Jesus probably all day, listen to him, listen, listening to him teach all the spiritual truths, all the ways to live your life. And the one question this guy has for him is this. Actually, he says something to this effect. Hey, Jesus, boss my brother around a little bit. Make him give me my stuff. Now, we read a lot of Jesus' teaching, and you know, it's just odd that that would be the one question he would have would be about his stuff. But he responds to this person this way. He says, he said to them, he said to the group around him, he said, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So we don't know if this guy was really looking for his fair fair share or he was just greedy. But honestly, at least in my life, a lot of times those two things look very similar. And it's hard for me even to know the difference when I'm just want my fair share or I'm really greedy but Jesus warns this command he says watch out why does he say that because we're all we all susceptible to this idea of greed and selfishness selfishness is everywhere and it comes in these subtle forms and and the ideal toy company back in the 1960s knew what to do put an image of something up a little kid would want and you get them saying I want I want I want And it sneaks up on you, and it sneaks up on me. And he says, watch out, and he says, because life is not all about your possessions. It's not about what you have. And throughout time, people have struggled with this ideology that you are what you own. If you wear the nice clothes, you have the nice things, you drive the nice car. But he told them... uh, these warnings, and he said that that's not the way it is. Continues on in verse 16. He tells them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. So why did the ground produce this great crop? Because the guy was good? Because the guy was awesome? Well, we don't really know much about the guy. But the certain rich man, he had a great crop. But what we do know in answering the question, why did it produce... If we understand the Scriptures, as we get to know God, we know that He is the giver of every good gift. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. So we know every good gift comes from God. And this man's man's ground produced great fruit, a great crop, but you can trace it backwards. And this is what we always need to do. We need to trace back the blessing all the way back to the blesser, the person who gave it to us. And it will always ultimately be God. So he had a good crop. Why? Because perhaps it was just good ground, right? Good weather, good decisions that he made. Maybe he put in a good amount of work. Maybe he got good help. Maybe he got good advice. But he did all that because he had good health. And perhaps he had a good genetics to make him so smart. But either way, at the end of the day, if we are smart, if we are wise, we trace every good gift back to God because in the snap of a finger, we're gone. Your mental capacity could be, could be deleted or diminished in a heartbeat. Your physical capacity can come and go at, at, the, at the slightest thing. No one knows uh, what's happening next, but we can say with James that every good gift comes from God and we can trace it back and we can credit the source. When we get a good gift, we can enjoy the gift, but we should also credit the source. And again, he told this parable about the ground produced. The rich man did not produce the crop. He was there, but the ground produced it, and God, through the ground, produced it. He may have thought, it's just the luck of the draw, or I'm so special that that the fates uh, and destiny have fallen on me, and I'm I'm just lucky, and I'm rich. But he had a problem. He had such a good crop, he had a problem. And so he thought to himself, what shall I do? What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Are you feeling sorry for him already? It's like, oh man, of all the stories in the Bible, that's just sad. He had so much stuff, he didn't know what he was going to do with him. So um, the complaints that we have as rich people meaning that we have all that we need in life, uh, not the, maybe the abundance. 
kind of falls on, on hollow ears, doesn't it? I mean, it's like, oh boy, he had a problem, so what? But he asked the question, what shall I do? And I, I was thinking about what, what were his options back in those times. Well, he probably could have found somebody who had, uh, had some barns, and he could have rented, rented somebody else's barn, but that cuts into your profit. Perhaps he could have sold it at a discount to get rid of it all and just turn it all into hard, cold, hard cash. <clears throat> but the problem, most people in, the, in that day lived paycheck to paycheck. And for you, that might mean week to week or month to month. But they basically worked for what they ate that day, and that's all they had. So if he was going to sell it all, he was going to sell it at a huge discounted price. He could have built a barn on, on the, the place where he got the the crop from but then that cuts into next year's profit right so not good so he's got this problem he's got this problem and he has has an idea a little bit uh, of what to do but it's kind of these first world problems are again it's just really hard to feel sorry for him and most of us are probably not all of us but most of us are probably in that same that same boat like this lady here you've seen her on the internet i forgot my wallet at home so they gave me coffee for free and they made it wrong, and now I can't complain about it. You just, you got to feel sorry for her. I have to wake up at 4 a.m. to go on this really expensive, cool vacation. You feel sorry for her yet? Or the, this one here, I know I'm, a, I'm out of olive oil, but I don't know in which house. Is it this house or that house? Or then, this was actually my favorite, is it my diamond earrings keep scratching my iPhone. Oh. It's tough. Life gets, can get pretty hard. Or his case would be more like this. A friend comes to you and they say this. They say, listen, I got this problem. You know, did you know when you put your money in the bank that the FDIC only insures it to $250,000? That's all. I, I'm going to have to find another bank. And you start feeling sorry for those people, right? Well, the rich guy says, I got a problem. I got too much stuff. But then... In his own wisdom, he, f he finds a solution. He said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and I will build bigger ones. And there I will store all the grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. So he, he kind of does this note to self from himself. Hey, here's a good idea. I know it's good because it came from me. And I know what I'll do. And his arrogance is, comes, comes across. He gives himself this great advice. And if we notice in this passage in the one verse before that no less than 12 times he's focused on himself. The red doesn't really come through as good as I thought it would when I, when I put it. But those are the, the times that he says, I, me, my, oh. He had all these great ideas and he had this bigger barn mindset. I'm just going to build a bigger barn. I'm, first of all, I'm going to tear down my old barn because it's not big enough. And I'm going to build me a nicer barn. And so the question is, uh, are we being consumers? Or are we being consumed by our stuff? He didn't acknowledge God in his plans. There was no God, oh, I'm worrying about other people. It's just, here's what I'll do. I have a good idea. I'm a smart guy. By the way, I hit the jackpot, you know. It all came my way. I had great, great crops. So my plan is firmed up, and I know what I'm going to do. And when you make plans without God, you dishonor Him and you insult Him. Because He, as believers, we've claimed Him as Lord, the boss, the person who guides and leads our life, who's smarter than us, who knows the future, who has all this great power. But we say, God, I know you've got a lot of good ideas, but I've got a, I've got a better one. And I'm going to put all my stuff in these bigger barns. And we dishonor Him. In the book of James, chapter 4, this advice comes through to us. Listen, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this city, spend a year there and carry on business and we'll make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a, a mist that appears for a little while and then it vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and we'll do this and we'll do that. As it is, you're, you boast and you brag and all such boasting all such boasting is evil. And so we, we have a guy who says, I'm going to build bigger barns. And, 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 and in Jesus' story, all he seems to be caring about is himself. No concern for those around him. But God said to him, 
You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then, who will get what you've prepared for yourself? And that's a fair question. Who will get it? It'll be the guy similar to the guy that asked Jesus the initial question. The guy who said, hey, divide all that up. All the stuff you have, all the stuff the rich guy has, is going to go into a bowl, and everybody's going to fight over it. See who gets it. That's kind of how it works. Unless you have a really good will. And then they'll probably fight over it anyway. This just seems to, be, seems to be how it goes. But Jesus says to this person, you're a fool. You're very short-sighted. The divide the inheritance guy has a heyday. All the while, you decided to live your life for you, eat, drink, and be merry. And he did that, but he only got one day. Now, no one knows how long you're going to have or I'm going to have, but there's going to come a time when it's all going to go away. And his dependence and his identity was stuck in the material things that constituted his whole life. His whole life. There was a French painter named Eugene something or other. I'm not trying to pronounce his last name. And he, uh, he, he came up and he painted this, this portrait of this parable. It was two pictures. And here's the guy. He sold, sold a bunch of his stuff. got bags of money and it looks like he's doing pretty good. And, and the Lord comes to him and says, hey, you blew it. This, this is your last day. You got all this good stuff, but somebody else is going to get it. And we're reminded what we looked at earlier in verse 15. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. It slips in everywhere on us. Because life does not consist of the abundance of your possessions. And so in one day, he went from the rich guy, which everybody knows the rich guy, But he went and became just like all the rest of them. He became the dead guy. One day here, one day flourishing. Next day he's gone. And eternity awaited him. And he was rewarded. Again, this is just a parable. But the guy from the story would have been rewarded in heaven based on what he did with his stuff here. And it's a sad state. Here he is. He's he's dead. And then Jesus makes a point at the end of the story. A few more actually, but he says this. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Now let's understand about the bigger barns concept. That that this, this passage does not say this. Jesus did not say this. This is how it is with anyone who stores up things for himself. Right? He doesn't say that. He didn't put the period there. He put the period where he put it but is not rich toward God. He's not saying you can't have things. He's not saying you can't own things. He's saying your things shouldn't own you. That should not be the focus of your life. If your identity is in those things, then some adjustment needs to be made. So how does one become rich toward God? Well, you got to get some things in alignment. you got to put your money where your mouth is. And we have to keep God in the picture at all times. And so the question for you this morning, the question for me is, where do your riches point? Are you rich toward God? Are you rich toward yourself? Are you somewhere in the middle? A little bit of both. He never says we can't have things. But he says that cannot be the most important thing in your life. And uh, I'm afraid many times in my life that has happened to me. See, because Bob the Beetle wasn't the first time I'm sure that, that I wanted something. That I saw, I want, I want, I want. Because then it turned to G.I. Joe's a little bit later on in life, you know. And then it turned to, uh, to, to, to games and things and cars and baseball cards. And it just one thing after another comes into your life. And it seems like we spend our lives looking for one new shiny thing that wears out, that breaks, that's not important. Chase the next shiny thing, next shiny thing, next shiny thing. And next thing we know, we're in the same boat as this guy. We spend our whole life chasing after things. And why does that happen? Because we let God slip out of the picture. We don't keep Him in our thoughts. We don't keep Him in our minds. And the man in the parable and the man that spoke to Jesus, both would have been aware at least some degree of the Old Testament principles. And here's one that I think applies here in Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. How often? At all times. And His praises will always be on my lips. If we practice 
keeping our God at the center of our life, what happens is that we are not as enamored by those things. I'm not saying you won't be enamored some. You know, every time I go to the, to the, the, the music shop, you know, I don't go there very often. You know why? Because I want, I want this. And I, oh, that would be cool. And I can get caught up in that. And I know you have things in your life that are the same way. But what we need to do is we need to put our heart and our mouth and our money, and we need to put them all on the same page, and they need to be focused toward God. It doesn't mean you can't have things. It doesn't, but when you do that, you ask God first, right? You include Him in that decision. And so He gives us, he gives us this great lesson, and then He goes on to talk to His disciples. He tells the story, and then He turns to His disciples. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothes. So Jesus addresses first the extravagant. Everything beyond this is extravagant. If we have all we need to live, then we are, should be content with what we have and the Lord in our lives. And he dealt with the extravagant, but he comes back now and he deals with the essentials. He's saying not only don't get caught up in the extravagant, but don't worry about these essentials. You work, you do the things you need to do, but God says, I'm going to provide those things for you. I'm going to provide those things. And he gives us some comparisons. He says, consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They don't have barns or st storehouses, and yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than the birds? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life since you cannot do this very little thing? Why do you worry about the rest? So he tells them, don't worry. Don't get consumed about this lifestyle of the rich and famous. But don't worry that, 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 that you're not going to get what you need because he says, I'm going to provide it. And he gives another comparison. He says this, consider, consider the lilies, how they grow. They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his splendor was not dressed like one of these. That's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, is thrown into the fire. How much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And so he turns to his disciples and he, and he lays out the lesson. He's saying, I'm going to take care of everything you need, the essentials. Don't, when I bless you, don't get caught up in those things and make sure that you focus yourself right and he says it matter of fact in the next verse don't set your heart on what you will eat or drink and don't worry about it the pagan world runs after such things and your father knows that you need them so he says don't fixate on what you need and actively seek me run after me seek the kingdom and all these things will be given to you as well are you in the business of actively seeking God? I hope that you are. Uh, it's a full-time job. Keeping your mind and your thought directed in that way. The good news about riches is, is when, we, when we give them up and we seek the kingdom of God, not only does He add what we need, but He also promises us great riches in the hereafter. Don't be afraid, little flock. And I guess the disciples at that point were the little flock and all the rest of us who came to believe later were the big flock. Don't, don't, don't take that as a theological bank, but it just kind of seems that way. So I'm, I'm including me here. Don't be afraid, little flock. Your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Guess what? God's not holding out on you. No, when you use your life up for Him, He counts it as a heavenly blessings you stored up in heaven. And he goes on to say that in verse 33. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that won't wear out. Treasures in heaven that will not be exhausted where no thief comes near and no moths destroy. Because where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Again, my progression in my life is probably like yours. I'm doing pretty good, and then shiny things come along. Oh, I want, I want, I want, I want. And we are in a time of record prosperity and consumerism, so my challenge to you is the same as Jesus. Be on your guard. Be careful. Because that selfishness and that greed creeps in. The man in the story, the man in the parable, he chose to, to focus on what was next for him rather than uh, what the next life might bring. 
in the words of one of the songs that I listen to regularly, it says, you possess, you possess your possessions or they possess you. And that's kind of how it works, right? Like you just, you're consumed by them or you're using them for the kingdom's work. So I'm going to bring you full circle back, back to Bob the Beetle because it's just, just exciting. And, and, it's, and it's available for about $54.95 on eBay. I just couldn't bring myself. I, I could really see me having fun for an hour, but it wasn't going to be worth that to bring and show it to you. But a four-year-old, when he, when he yells, Bop the Beetle, Bop the Beetle, oh, it's, it's just kind of cute, and it warms your heart, and you go buy him that. And uh, this past birthday of my four-year-old granddaughter, coming for a full circle, she had seen a show. They re revamped and revised the, the, the old game that I had, or at least my kids had, called uh, Hungry Hungry Hippos. Now you guys remember that one, right? All right. So it was rerun many years later. Hungry Hungry Hippos for days on end after, oh, so we got it for her birthday. It was the best game ever. She loved it. It was wonderful. You know, and it just warms your heart as a parent, as a grandparent, as a friend. Oh, little kids. But it's not so heartwarming when we as adults get Go from one shiny thing to another. I gotta have it. I gotta have it. I would hope that uh, that you and I both have and can continue to grow up from such things. First Corinthians thirteen eleven. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I just got bigger toys. <laughs> I hope. That's not, I hope that's not your life, and I'm working on that not being my life. But I put away childish things, and I said, I'm going to put things in the right priority. I'm going to get my heart, my mouth, and my money all on the same page. Are you caught up in getting a little bit? Don't be. Let's, let's take on the Spirit of Christ and be, make this a season of giving and a lifestyle of sharing. Let's pray together. God, we pray that you'll uh, bring these words home to our hearts. That whatever you have for us, God, will say yes to that. God, our, our response is not just about our money, but it's about our very lives, saying that you need to be the center of everything. So as we take these closing moments now to worship you, to celebrate you, we pray that you'll speak to each of our hearts as only you can. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.